Hello, welcome back. This is topic 2.2 and this is all about water. So here is the guidance understandings, everything IV expects you to know for this topic. As you can see, it's kind of shorter, so it's probably go by a little faster, but there's still a lot of information. So basically, this is a water molecule. As you might remember from chemistry class, there's an oxygen and two hydrogens, which is why it's known as H2O or even dihydrogen monoxide. So there are some properties that you will need to recall from your chemistry class, and if not, then we'll just go over a review real quick. Basically, oxygen has six valence electrons, and hydrogen each has one. So what's going to happen is, is when they bond, since oxygen is more electronegative, or it just basically has a uh, more positive nucleus, what's going to happen is it's going to kind of hog all these electrons, and it's going to make this side um, negative, while this side over um, where the hydrogens are is going to become slightly positive. And basically what this is, is this is a polarity. And this is going to give um, rise to many of the properties that we see um, of, with water. And another thing to notice is that we, when you have um, hydrogen, there's the opportunity for hydrogen bonding. This is when a hydrogen connected to um, usually an oxygen or some other element is um, positive and hydrogen bonds with an oxygen, a fluorine, or a, um, yeah, fluorine or a nitrogen. So as you see, we have an oxygen and a hydrogen, and they're connected to each other, so there's an opportunity for hydrogen bondings between water molecules, not within the water molecule itself. So right off the bat, we have this two, if we have two water molecules and we draw this polarity, we're going to notice something. And we're going to notice, if you know, if you remember, um, opposite charges um, attract. So what's going to happen is, is when you put water into, or if you put many water molecules to, um, together, there's going to be an attraction between those molecules. This is known as adhesion. A, D, and adhesion. Adhesion. And what happens is, is basically the water molecules are going to want to stick together. Now, this causes many different properties. If, you'll, if you think of roots, basically the water, as the water evaporates from the leaves, the water is able to be sucked up. Um, through the roots. This is basically known as capillary action. I mean, there's also capillary action as well, which basically if you put a sm very small tube in some water, it'll suck up all by itself. This also leads to something called the polarity of the water molecules also leads to something known as cohesion. If you have, say, maybe a slightly negative surface, these positive ends of the water molecules are going to want to stick to this. So basically, if you think of putting um, a drop of water on a if you just think of having a drop of water on any surface, basically there's going to be some cohesion between those two. This also, um, basically these two forces kind of work together in order to create what is known as high surface tension. And basically if you put water, um, there's going to be the ability of um, something, say like a small insect, to walk on water due to this high connection between the water molecules. Or if you put a penny and you put a drop of water, it'll create a bubble that kind of seems to defy the laws of physics when in reality it's just these um, intermolecular attractions. So now IB expects you to look at water versus methane. Because they both have similar molar masses, which basically means they weigh the same, they're expected to have similar properties. However, methane, or CH4, is a gas at room temperature, while H2O in water is a liquid. And basically what you need to look at here is basically this is due to the properties of water. Not only is it due to its polarity, um, their intermolecular forces. It's also due to the hydrogen bonding, which is basically keeping all these molecules together, which makes it much harder for water to be a gas. So these, intermolecul in, these intermolecular forces also give rise to a crystalline structure of um, ice. So basically think that all the water molecules are very organized and they're very structured in ice. And what this does is it kind of expands it, giving it a lower density. And since water has a lower dense, or ice has a lower density than water, it is able to rise in water. So since it floats, this allows for water to freeze over on the top and aquatic life to still be able to live underneath it. And this is very important in order for evolution and basically allowing life to um, persist in cold temperatures aquatically. We also have a solvent um, properties. So basically, say we have a molecule of sodium chloride, which is known as table salt. Well, when this is put into water, it's going to be broken apart into sodium, which is going to be positive, and chloride, which is going to be negative. This is due to ionic bonding, since sodium basically gives up its um, electron to chloride. So what's going to happen here is since this is negative, 
this negative um, charge is going to attract all these positive ends of the water molecules. And on the other hand, if we have sodium, this is sodium is positive, so it's going to attract all the negative ends of the water molecules. And basically, this makes water a very strong um, dissolving or solvent. So which statement is most correct about water? Um, to get, give you a minute to pause and answer. Okay, so let's go through it. The atoms within the molecule are held together by hydrogen bonds. While water does participate in hydrogen bonds, it's only between molecules, not within. Water molecule has a low heat capacity. We'll look at this later, or a little bit um, later in the um, slideshow, but basically it has a higher heat capacity, and basically that really, we're not talking about enzyme reactions here. Um, water molecules are polar, that's correct. Therefore, fatty acids do not dissolve. Well, that's true, because um, fatty acids are nonpolar, while water is polar, and basically like dissolves like. So polar molecules dissolve polar molecules. So basically, you're gonna need those charges in order to dissolve. And if you notice, if you try to mix water and oil, like the densities do play a, diff um, a factor in that, but basically that those oils are going to want to stay away from water at all costs. If you think back to the phospholipids, that's kind of what we where we saw with the um, hydrophobic tails. And basically that's kind of what we're looking at here. And then ice has a higher density, we already know it has a lower density, so D is correct, and that leaves levels with C. Blood is a water-based transport medium, which property makes water a good transport medium? I'll give you a second. So it has a high specific heat, we'll get to that later, but basically that just means that water, it takes a lot of heat for water to increase in temperature, and that doesn't really make sense when we're talking about transporting anything. Transparency, um, well, transparency, since water is transparent, um, it basically all that means that it allows light to go through and plants at the bottom of the ocean or the bottom of a lake, the bottom of a pond to survive. So that transparency, doesn't really have too much to do with the transport medium, but it is still very important for life. Versatility as a solvent. Now we're getting to onto something. So if water can dissolve a lot of things, then it has the ability, such as our blood, if used in our blood, in order to transport, um, say, glucose which, or um, salts um, and all these different things. And then we have greatest density at 4 degrees Celsius. Um, that's not really talking about transporting. So yeah, we're going to go with C. So another thing is sweat. So this is when we start talking about its high specific heat. So basically a high specific heat means that for a drop of water, it's going to take a lot of heat energy in order to raise that temperature of that drop of water. It's about 4.18 degrees Celsius, 1.84 degrees Celsius. Um, Sorry, no, that's just, I'm in, not in my head. So it's a, for every 4.184 joules of heat energy, we raise water by one degree. Fun fact, this is known as a um, calorie, and that we can talk, we talk about that more later, or that kind of goes into chemistry. But basically, well, all you really want to know for this is that water has a, it takes a lot of energy in order to raise the temperature of water. So basically, say you're really hot, your body gives off heat all the time. So if water is there to absorb that heat, it's going to just constantly absorb it because it takes a lot of um, energy for that water to increase in temperature. And finally, once it does evaporate, um, it, you have get, gotten rid of a lot of energy uh, heat that the body has produced and basically effectively cooling off the body. Another thing is the heat of vaporization. If you remember, um, the um, phase change diagram, which you might not really remember from chemistry, but basically all you need to know is that while water is transitioning from a water, um, from a liquid to a gas, it takes a lot of energy, a lot of heat in order to um, make that change. So basically that is why since it takes so much heat in order to do all these processes with water, it, it makes it very easy to cool down the body. So here's a practice problem here. What makes what property of water makes it a suitable coolant? So basically, right off the top of your head, you should be thinking high specific heat, high specific or high heat of vaporization, vaporization. So we'll go and we'll start looking at the answer choices. So it takes a lot of energy to increase the temperature of water. Now this is true, so we're gonna put a maybe. It takes a lot of energy for water to evaporate. That's also true, so we'll put a maybe and we'll come back to those choices. 
water molecules are cohesive and stick to the skin. Well, this is important for keeping water on the skin, but not necessarily important when it comes to cooling down the body. And water is a good solvent, and that's basically not coolant either. So now between these two, these two things, or all these things are true. But basically, what is it that gives water the ability to cool us down? And that's going to be the amount of energy it takes for water to evaporate. So we're putting in all this heat, all this heat, and basically, since it takes so much heat for the water to evaporate, it's going to take away the heat from our body and cool us down. And it's worth noting here that it takes the heat with it. So basically, if you notice here, increased temperature of water, yeah, but he's kind of still in the system. If we have a body here, just say this is a person, and this water is evaporating, it's going to take that heat with it. So outline the thermal, cohesive, and solvent properties of water. This is an example of a free response question that you'll get on the IB test. And basically, what you want to go is just go back and think of all these properties that we listed. So it has strong intermolecular forces, and basically that's going to be the base of all these properties. Um, we can talk about when you talk about thermal, um, the high intermolecular forces or the hydrogen bonding. All these things take a lot of energy to not only heat the water but also to um, evaporate the water. Um, methane. You can talk about how it's light, but it still has it till it still stays liquid at room temperature because of the um, high um, high intermolecular forces um, and basically you can re reference that cooling off the skin and sweat and how it's a coolant. You can talk about cohesion and how um, when water, since water is a polar molecule, it likes to stick to each other and it forms hydrogen bonds with one another and this creates high surface tension and what this does is it allows small creatures to walk on water. Um, we can talk about it as a solvent and how this polar action allows um, in order it allows water to dissolve all these other polar things such as sodium chloride or any ionic compound or uh, a lot of ionic compounds I should say sugars um, gases we can talk about or you can basically um, describe all these things in polarity in how um, that affects hydrophobic and um, hydrophilic molecules and you can talk about um, Basically, that's all the main points you're going to hit. If you can have a list here that I made uh, real quick. And basically, those are all the points that you're going to want to hit for, say, this question. Thank you.